Now, look, I don't want to have any smart talk from any of you. All I'm doing is working and just rehearsing my art. I mean, after all, it's not easy to be a creative whiner. And, uh, you know. <laughs> Bring it up, little thing. <laughs> I've just, I've just reduced to 30 seconds all plays that have been written in the past 15 years for off-Broadway production. Bring it up. A Chinese man stacked his belongings on the street yesterday as he prepared to move to another apartment. This happened in Boston, and tonight we would like to salute Boston as a town where stuff really happens. Pow! Wake up, all of you. Boston, for crying out loud. This Chinese man stacked his belongings on the street in Boston as he prepared to move to another apartment. Then he went back upstairs for more of his junk. From a third floor window, he saw a city sanitation crew pitching his cases into the scoop of a gigantic garbage truck. Dashing downstairs, the man made a jump for the scoop, which picked him up along with his belongings and whap, dumped him into the garbage truck. (laughs) How was it that W.C. Fields put it? Chinese people. The truck operator realized what had happened, shut off the engine before the man was hurt, and he emerged, covered from head to foot with garbage. But in possession of his belongings. Police said that the man apparently was unable to speak English. They could not get his name or translate his angry cries. Please, Nick, if you if you will, please. Bring it up, big. This is gonna be an exciting summer, friends. All right, thank you, thank you, Nick. Oh, I had an exciting time in Boston here the other day. I was up there. Yeah, and, you know, they've got this television station there. It's Channel 2. It's a kind of a, you know, big whoopee channel there, and they have big popcorn machine and all that. Tremendous channel, and I'm on Channel 2 up there. See, they had a, yeah, Channel 2 in Boston, and it was a very serious channel. You know, these people, it's a culture channel. Spell it with a K there, see? And, uh, culture. And so, uh, they had a, <laughs> they had an auction where they were auctioning off all this stuff, see, to raise scratch. And uh, they have it for a week. Yeah, they have guest auctioneers like a Jim Lonborg, who pitches occasionally for the Boston Red Sox. I mean, you know, when he feels like it. I mean, after all, these uh, well, ball players are getting very independent. You know, they don't. Uh, you did, you just don't get a guy to pitch when you know, like they used to have rotation. Not anymore. It's when he's you know when he's finished working on his book. In fact, uh, practically every athlete today is a uh, you know he's working on a book. In fact, one pro golfer I heard about he says he's looking out over a crowd of golfers he says you got nothing but clothing salesmen and authors out there today there ain't no golfers no more that was sam sneed with that he spit 422 yards right into the cup of the 17th hole like that but you know everybody's writing the book pete rose did you hear about him he plays uh, for the cincinnati reds he's a notorious tough guy really you know tough tough hole he's the real thing and pete rose says the first book he ever read all the way through was the book that he just wrote. So, uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, you know, what are you going to do? You know, that's just that just that way it is. Everywhere you look, there's a ghostwriter writing for somebody, some athlete, you know, athlete. So I went up to Boston saying, I'm, I'm a guest auctioneer. And they provide everybody with a table full of stuff you're going to auction off, you see. And I guess they... they they decide what you're going to auction depending on your particular personality, your bent, the way you are. So I look at the table. I couldn't believe what I see there. 
First of all, there was a set of two brand new 675 by 14 tires, white sidewall, that uh, fit perfectly the 1937 Hupmobile. Also, the 1936 Willys Knight and the 1938 Nash Emerson model. So I tried to auction those up. It's kind of tough. And uh, I tried to sell them on the idea that maybe, you you know, to make a nice uh, coffee table or something you could have in your house. And, and a real conversation piece. You know, have a couple of tires there. And you have a garbage can lid or something. I'm talking about a really creative uh, furnishing. And then I saw in the middle of the table two of the worst table lamps I've ever seen in my life. Unbelievable. These two, well, actually, in a way, they were pure. They were beautiful because they represented Slav art in its most vital phase. You know, every art form goes through the period of development, and then there's the period of vitality, living, breathing, and then there's the period of decline, decay, and finally the period of... Uh, a total debauch. You see, it's, uh, you see this in Byzantine art, of course. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, <laughs> I did that well tonight. <laughs> Bye, George. And uh, yes, I do quite well on Channel 13 with the pointers. <laughs> I would, you know, black and white is groovy. With it, yeah, I'd have a big sign that says Byzantine. Then I point, and the camera goes, chick, 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 picks up Byzantine. Thing. Somebody says, I thought Byzantine was spelled with a Y. How come they got it with an I there? Well, of course, the early Byzantine was with a Y. The late Byzantine was with an I. And that's what happens when an art begins to decline. It's bad news. So I started to auction off these two awful-looking lamps. They were reputedly in Chinese Ming style, giant. And uh, one of them was a queen, and the other was a king. They were they were made out of this uh, sort of plastic, and they were painted sort of a puce colored. And uh, yes, oh, nothing greater than a puce colored Chinese type Oriental medieval king lamp. And they had an oyster shell colored, uh, it was just, well, it was worse than I'm telling you, actually. It sounds kind of nice when I'm describing it. Well, I started to auction this stuff off. Would you believe it? I got 150 bucks for these two lamps. And at the same time, I was auctioning off a beautiful watercolor that some guy had done, who was a famous artist, and I got $40 for that. Which teaches you, no, it was right there in front of me. It was on the Culture Channel. It taught me where it is. It taught me where it is. Ugliness pays. It's dough in the bank. I feel sorry tonight about piranhas. Boy, are they getting the bad mouth press. Who did you hear about the piranhas? I read you an article. It says, listen, send your pet piranha to an out-of-state New Year's Eve party because after December 31st, 1970, the vicious tropical fish will be illegal in the state of New York. According to Albert G. Hall, director of the State Conservation Department's Division of Wildlife and Anti-Piranha Department, it is now required for you to register your pet, your piranha, by July 1st. And then you've got six months to get rid of them. It says the ruling, the result of legislation enacted in 1969 in Albany, was designed, quote, and we quote here, boy, haven't we got a dill dock of a, of, a, of, a, of a legislature? I'll tell you, our legislature in the state of, of New York seriously, reminds me of the chorus of a bad comic opera of the late 18th century Italian school. You know, with the tambourines going around with the whole... Give me the little tambourines. Come on, let's, let's, I just, let's, let's salute the, the uh, state legislature going around. Come on. Yeah, cha 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 Here they go. Cha-cha, 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 cha-cha. Oh, there it goes, there it goes. You see, you can just see them coming out. It says, legislature enters stage from left. And the soprano, give me a little echo chamber. And the soprano sings. And with that, the chorus comes out and sings. Can you imagine the state legislature of the state of New York believing that if piranhas got loose in any of the rivers of New York, they would provide a danger to the local fish? Have you caught any fish in the state of New York, those tough, miserable catfish? What are you talking about? <laughs> Can you imagine that? In fact, I called up a, 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 a pet shop today, and I got a hold of a, a fish expert, and I says, hey, fish expert, and he says, yes? 
I said, uh, you know, they too talk like that. He was heavily influenced by suckers early in his youth. And so I said, uh, hey, fish expert, uh, what would happen if a piranha got loose in, in say, uh, Raritan Creek? Hmm? I said, did you hear what I said? I said, what would happen if a piranha got loose in Raritan Creek? No way. I said, what do you mean, no way? He says, well, no piranha's going to last for more than eight and a half minutes if the water's under 70 degrees, right from the start. And he says, and furthermore, the state waters of the state of New York are too brackish. No, they mean, you know, too much of a salt content to sustain a piranha. The piranhas are getting a bad mouth. Let's salute that legislature. Can you imagine the arguments that went on to outlaw piranhas? Ah, shit the ball! Put your chum, but I'm a whoop, but chum, whoop, big, but you, you, but the whoop, but, but, but you. Now we're paying all the dough for this, you know. Those guys are getting per diem on it. Bring it up. <laughs> That was the honorable representative from the upstate department of Queens who led the fight. By the way, I'm probably the only guy you know of who's ever really seen the piranha in its natural state. I really did. Yep. In Peru. And, uh, yeah, they had them there. It was up in the Amazon River Basin. And uh, they're highly overrated. The piranha has been getting bad mouth press for years. Yeah, there's always an article in one of these mail magazines, you know, you know, you know the type of mail magazines. Uh, it always shows a, a, a Marine coming up out of a hole in the ground, you know, and he's got blood all over his helmet, and he's carrying this M1. It says, I killed 149 Japs at Iwo Jima. The story inside, told for the first time. The magazine Guts. You know, the fantastic magazine. You've seen these magazines, haven't you? And then there's always a special article that says... The fish that can kill everything within four miles in just seven and a half seconds. It'll strip a cow down to its own, down to its bones, down to its skin in less time than it tells to take to tell the tale. Oh, come on. I tell you, I, I saw a bunch of piranhas in Peru were standing around by the street corner weeping and yelling because they were getting such bad press in the States. Oh, man. Uh, speaking of piranhas, this is WOR. We're in New York. And here they come. Here they come. Oh, look out. They'll strip your bones right down to nothing. Seven seconds. Here comes one now. Ah! Got me. Right now, you can get famous Ford Quiet in a Galaxy 500 at a special sale price. Now, if you're a family man who likes to get away from the family every now and then, you'll love the Quiet Ride. There are a lot of little things about the Galaxy 500 that make it a great buy. Like windshield wipers that are three inches longer than its nearest competitor. 100% nylon carpeting to the other guy's 20%. Three-speed automatic instead of two-speed. Right now, Galaxy 500 has some other extras as part of a special package. Like vinyl trim inside, wheel covers outside, even a vinyl roof. All at a special sale price and yours right now during your Ford dealer's economy drive. Economy drive means economy. It means the good-looking Galaxy 500 all the way to Maverick, America's biggest-selling economy car. Come on. See you, Ford dealer. Anybody got a, uh, a uh, dictionary out there? Look up Maverick. I'm thinking of it. You know the only guy I ever knew who had a piranha? And uh, I, I knew a guy who actually owned the piranha, and he kept it in his office. And, uh, yes, he worked over in NBC. And, uh, well, of course, uh, it would be natural for a guy who works at NBC who would have a piranha, either that or he is a piranha. The <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, you hear it. Well, you know, you know the, there used to be a guy down in the basement at NBC there that had the knife sharpening uh, you had the concession there. Because, you know, you don't want to stab a guy in the back with a dull knife. And so, yeah, he used to have a lot of business, especially around the first year, around Christmas party time. Oh, listen, I'll tell you. I one time saw a guy come out of a Christmas party after only five minutes. He looked like a pin cushion from behind, all the blades sticking out. All the, he's dead, you know, he didn't make it. Yeah, he's working down at a place down on 3rd Avenue now, selling bagels. But nevertheless, he was working at NBC, this friend of mine. And, uh, 
he he didn't have anything to do. You know, what happens when you get into a lot of these big outfits like that? Somebody will, in a fit of uh, creativity will hire somebody, and then they forget what they hired him for. Either that or the guy that hired him gets fired. You know, down the chute he goes, and so here he sits. So he's in his office all the time, sitting around there, and uh, he they didn't give him anything to do. And so what he did, you know how time hangs, you know, how it hangs heavy on your hands. And, well, you know what they used to say all the time. What happens to idle hands, Nick? That's right. They are working in the devil's workshop, right? Well, he began to work in the devil's workshop, so <laughs> he did. First, he took up crochet. And, uh, yeah, he used to crochet these erotic pillow covers. Sit there and... And, uh, yeah, it was kind of nice. And uh, he was making $174,000 a year, too. See, they hired him when somebody had decided to do this gigantic two-and-a-half-hour color show that was going to be on 278 stations, and he was going to be director of it. Then the whole shebang fell through, and they decided to do a weather show instead. See, so uh, here he was. <laughs> he had, a, you know, like, a 28-year contract, and he's sitting up in his office there, and so he took up crocheting. Well, that got to be a little dull, and... He kept sticking his finger with the needle and all that stuff. And and uh, then he took up drinking for a while. That got kind of dull. And uh, then one day he's walking along 6th Avenue. And he goes past, you know, on 6th Avenue from the 50s. There was this tremendous pet store up there around 54th Street. And he's walking along there one day. He used to go out and take a walk every, maybe take a walk for a week and a half or so. You know, just go out and walk. And, uh, yeah, and whenever they'd ask him what he was doing, he says he was out observing life. And that's important for a director, see. And he used to observe life up and down 6th Avenue. So he went into this place. You know, he's a little pet shop, and he saw all those monkeys. And first he thought it was a friend of his swinging in there, but uh, he realized that they, you know, they had a lot of monkeys. So he, he went in there. Because, you know, when you work at NBC, you, there are a lot of strange people over there. So he, he walks into the pet shop, and, and uh, he sees his fish. There are a lot of fish there, see. And he's not much of a fish type. And, uh, and so the uh, guy come up to him and says, uh, you interested in the fish? And, uh, well, up to that time, he had never thought much about buying a fish. So, he's, yeah, you know, I'm looking at the fish. So uh, the guy behind the counter says, so look at this bippy. And with that, he takes, a, you know, half a hamburger and throws it. Whap! This little baby goes after it. I'll tell you, he just knocked down that hamburger like Billy B. Dam. You know, just uh, whap like that, not even catch it. He just hit it. See? So my friend says, hey, that's a good little fish. He says, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, if you... Put somebody's foot in there, whap, nothing but toenails floating around there. That's all, see? So he says, what is it? He says, piranha. Oh, piranha, of course, some will speak, you know, kind of a gutter French he spoke. And so he says, ah, piranha, of course, some will, indeed he will, uh huh. And with that, he bought a piranha. Took it back. You know, when you buy a fish like that, you know, they give it to you in a bag. Because when you buy a fish, you know, you don't. Uh, you don't, uh, they don't give you the aquarium with it, you know. You ever buy a fish? You ever buy one? Well, he, he, they don't give you the aquarium with it. They put it in a plastic bag. So he's got this piranha in the plastic bag. He's carrying it down the street, and about every 15 feet, this baby, you know, reach out and snap at somebody's buttocks that's going by. He's saying, whap, like that, <laughs> and he's carrying it. Well, he realized that he found the soulmate. Because he used to do that, too, so that's something else. But uh, nevertheless, he, he took this, he took, <laughs> hi, George. He took this piranha, and he put it in his office. And uh, he bought himself a very, you know, a nice old lady type uh, uh, aquarium. You know, kind of a, a little flowers painted on the side. Had had the little metal frame. It was a kind of a baby blue frame with daisies painted on it. It was kind of nice, except that he had a piranha in it. Now, a piranha is a kind of nice looking fish, actually. It's kind of silver, and hey, you know, it's like a regular fish. Except it's got tusks, but outside of that, you get used to that. So... It had it a nice-looking fish, a friendly look on the face, anyway. And so my friend used to sit back in his desk, see, and uh, he'd wait for somebody to come in. Well, now, not hardly anybody came to see him, but once in a while they'd come in, and, the, you know, the one sweep out from under his desk. A, a, a fluvia would drop off of him after he'd been there six or seven months without working. So she, he, had, he had scales, actually. So uh, he'd sit in there. And they'd come in, they'd sweep up around. And once in a while, a VP would drift in there, you know, a VP that's being chased by the hounds. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. He, used to have, he used to have a sign on his door. You know what he had? had a sign that says, uh, Harbor here, Safe Haven. And, uh, yes, he, he used to provide the, he, he was like the Underground Railroad, see, whenever, whenever some, uh, 
you know, VP was being hounded by the sales department. He'd come running down the hall screaming and yelling, you know, and he forgot his uh, men's room key and all that stuff, and he didn't know where to hide, and they were after him. Well, Barry would open his door, and he'd, he'd give him haven, you know. He'd let him hide under his day bed, which he had in there. So once in a while, these, <laughs> these VPs would come in, and, and the guy said, oh, quick, quick, hide me. And uh, so Barry would hide him in the broom closet, and they would come out. And Barry used to like to feed the VPs over there, too, once in a while. He says, you know, especially in the spring of the year, they'll come up right close, and they'll eat out of your hand. And it was kind of nice. So, yeah, he used to stand up and feed them. And, he, he, yeah, he, they like cashew nuts. In case you're curious, uh, VPs, they don't particularly go for Spanish peanuts, but they like the cashew nuts. And so he'd stand out there with his hand, the one would come up and nuzzle him. And then Barry would walk back and he'd get him close to this fish tank, see? This is actually what he used to do. And he used to open them real quick so they w you know, wouldn't scare him because they're very, you know, the, most of the VPs that I've seen, particularly over there at NBC, are, are uh, quite shy, uh, especially during mating season. So he would open up the the door to his had this desk see it had sort of a fake place where you're supposed to put a, a, a typewriter actually had a bar built in there see and he'd open it up like that and <laughs> yeah it was very funny uh, how he used to work the bar he used to have little tubes that were, were designed to look like ballpoint pens and he'd be sucking on a pen so he looked like he's working actually he's drinking bourbon he's sucking it on the top of his desk well you got to do something over there. there's not much you can do you know that whole network's in charge of Hugh Downs, you know. You just there's not much else happens over there. See, once in a while, you know, somebody like Johnny Carson walks by and the bugles blow and all that. But outside of that, there's not much excitement over there. So he's sitting there and he opens up the door and he he kept he kept just keep little pieces of meat. See, he'd uh, buy meat and and keep it in there. And with that, he would take a piece of this meat. See, and he'd flick it up and it would go just like that. Zap. See, into the jar there with his you know right near this little this little aquarium, see, and this fish would take one look at it and go, let gone. Well, of course, you know what happens with a prawn. It's like anybody else, you see. You give him an inch, and he wants a little more than that. And so as soon as he hits the meat, up to this point, he's been pretty calm, see. And so he gets a little meat, and he starts looking around, see. He's comparing around, you know, it's like the, you know, the big scoff in the sky is dumping. So he goes back and forth, he's looking, and of course, the, the, the executive, this but poor, uh, this poor uh, drunken uh, VP that's in there, because most of them, you know, especially late in the afternoon, they can't see good or anything, see, and so here it is, he sees this fish, see, and he says, holy, well, you know, holy smokes, I'm, uh, you know, uh, he heard about guys seeing snakes, but you know, there's a, well, you know what's the next step after seeing snakes? When you start seeing fish. The minute you start seeing fish, and you're, you know, when you get the DTs, man, that's bad news. And he says, they used to run out. He says, they'd run out and jump in the elevator. And he never mentioned it after that. Nobody ever mentioned that they saw his piranha. By the way, he turned out to be a very good director. He directed uh, Wild in the Streets. Remember that movie? Yeah, see? So I guess he's still working with the piranhas. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you start working with a piranha, it's going to influence you heavily. Do you, you think we ought to do a commercial here? Anybody out there? How about a nice commercial? Wouldn't you like that? Guess you're feeding a security. Hit the ding-dong, please, Nick. Please. If you will, please. Oh, this is an exciting Oh, they sing on this one. I love the singing kind. Yeah. They're going to have a great flight. Hey, yeah, friendies, National Airlines wants to introduce you to a great vacation idea. Florida in the summer. When it's less crowded, prices are lower. The action, man, goes on. There are all kinds of Florida summer holidays you can plan. <laughs> Indeed. From a fling on Miami Beach to dining around in great restaurants, scoffing. You can even choose a cruise to get away from nearby Caribbean. Your travel agent can help you discover Florida this summer. And National Airlines, oh, we can take you there any day in a week. So come on, let's all sing together now. It's a great tune. Come on, sing you. Come on and have a happy Come on and have a great flight out of the Just ask your travel agent or call National Airlines. Gee, that's an exciting commercial. It's not in my key, but uh, it's kind of exciting. I do that well. You know what I'm saying? I shouldn't have told you this story about the piranha, should I? Listen, tonight is animal night on this show. Oh, you know, speaking of animals, do you know that, uh, that now you can get Blue Cross? Well, it's not really Blue Cross. It's a health insurance 
for your dog. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm sorry. You, you can get it. Well, wait till they start putting dogs on the Social Security and all that. You can get, I'm not kidding, it says Des Moines, Peace of Mind for Dogs and Cats has been made available by the Midwest Insurance Company of Des Moines. Oh, what madness. Any cat or canine who can come up with the 18 buck annual premium will get cash benefits of $100 for accidents and veterinary bills and a $10 deductible clause for sickness. I mean, you know, he gets per diem and all that. The dog's laying around sick. You know, ate a, you know, he ate a bad frog or something like that. So, <laughs> I mean, I, it doesn't make sense. After all, you know, the dog's got a lot of responsibilities. I'm telling you, wait till they start analyzing our time, friends. You know what we're going to have to do when we all leave? We're just going to have to burn it all. Because if we leave it around, they're going to think we're really, we're, you know, total cuckoos. As a matter of fact, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, <laughs> we are, you know. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, we got another one in there, Nick. Before we do that, uh, you, 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 you really can tell this is Tuesday, can't you? Oh, it's a bad day. Oh, bad, bad news day. I can just hear this. This Already I can hear the scratch of a pen. It's, Every time I do a really loose show, you know, I get these letters from these nice people with blue hair. And, uh, yes, I do. Mr. Shepard, why don't you do another wonderful show like the time you visited Japan? That was such a great show. In fact, my cousin Agatha... Oh, my God almighty. Where is it ever going to end? Uh, it ain't. That's the problem. Now, uh, would you please hit the ding-dong? There you go. What you are about to hear oh, this will be exciting. performed in the nude. Oh, for heaven's Dr. sakes. Pepper. Dr. Pepper is a nice, fizzy, soft drink. We it's have children. Very refreshing. Listening. But there is this problem. A lot of people don't know what it is. I mean, they don't understand it, do they, Mark? No. That's why Dr. Pepper is America's most misunderstood soft drink. They think it is everything from a health drink to a pepper sauce. But it's just a soft drink. All you have to do to like it is to try it. Here is a man now. Hello. Do you understand Dr. Pepper? Do you understand Dr. Pepper? No, I do not. And I am many men. Try it very well. Do you like it? Yes, I love it. That is good for now. You may chant with us. One day, all will chant. How about One that day, for a hip Oh, Dr. Pepper, Pepper, Pepper. Excuse me. I want to get in on that. Anytime there's any chanting going on, I, I love that. I'm a good chanter. I'll tell you this. A little chanting music, please, Nick. Just a little echo there. Oh, 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 oh. Just want to keep in trim. You never know. I might become a fanatic. You know, uh, speaking of uh, fanatics, uh, I saw a little sad note here, uh, if I may. Just a moment here. I'm looking up my sad note department. Yes. Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, have you noticed that the time goes so fast now? Uh, I mean, it, in fact, the thing can be completely out of. Uh, oh, you can't get the commercial out of the plug there. Oh, how sad! You know, the Dr. Pepper's going to keep playing over and over throughout all eternity. Our Dr. Pepper machine has gone out of its bird. Hit it again, Nick. Come on, let's see if it comes on. Come on, let's hit it. Hit it. Come on, let's see. It's stuck. About to hear. For heaven's sakes, it is. We movie. can't stop it. Doctor, this Dr. is a mystic Pepper experience. Nice fizzy soft drink. This is a mystic Very experience. Good. Kill it, Nick. Squirt it with the fire extinguisher. Do something. Our Dr. Pepper machine has gone out of it. Hello, help, help, Giff. Are you listening? Help. Help, help. Help. What are you going to do if tomorrow morning the entire John Gambling show is replaced by the Dr. Pepper commercial that keep repeating itself ad infinitum? Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> silly. You know, speaking of silliness, uh, as you know, uh, the generation gap is now measured in terms of two or three years. It is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. If, if you're 15, you're already out of it with a guy that's 12 now. Forget it. And, uh... I, in fact, you can see it in the books and all the stuff. I was in the bookshelf, uh, one of these stores downtown, you know, on 8th Street. And uh, 
Yeah, looking through all the stuff down there, piles of books. And there was this book, kind of sad-looking book, piles of dust on his little book. And uh, what do you think it was? Transcendental meditation is taught by his super holiness, the Maharishi Malash Yogi. You remember his big day? You remember? Gee, he was like, yeah, he, was, he was bigger than Monty Rock there for a while. Wasn't he? Whatever happened to Monty Rock, by the way? So, you know, you can you can be big, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're working in the Tom McCann shoe store, just like that. I mean, where is, where is his super holiness today? Oh, well. For that matter, where is Claire Trevor tonight, friends? I mean, everybody has to play his cards. <laughs> yeah, it was transcendental meditation as taught by his super holiness. And, you know, uh, I, I can just see some guy, you know, walking through that place there, his love beads hanging down. Of course, you know, you we, you go out of style very quickly. And uh, anybody who's wearing love beads today is a good nine years behind the times already. You remember when that brief period when they came out with these uh, these big plaques that guys were wearing, these big ding-dongs hanging around their neck, you know, look like you know, big things. Oh, Sammy Davis Jr. had them. They, they, you know, covered his whole clavicle. You know, a little skinny guy anyway. He looked like He looked like one of these. He looked like a big watch fob with feet and, uh, you know, a lot of teeth and all that. And uh, it was very exciting. Uh, of course, you know, that's the way showbiz is, you know, six one. And of course, I also understand that he had over 7,942 Nehru suits. And uh, that's kind of bad. Of course, that's nice, though, when you got to clean the car and you're looking for a rag. Uh, kind of an expensive rag, but... <laughs> oh, man. But, uh, you know, you get trapped by these things. It's uh, it's not easy. Hey, but listen, speaking of getting trapped, uh, uh, I, I've... Uh, I don't know how quite to approach this, uh, but did you see the Times this morning about this, uh, about the, what's going to happen this year? Oh, yeah, I've got it here. Listen to this. This is uh, this morning's Times. After 17 years, it says any day now, the Lorelei's of the insect world, the 17-year cicada, the cicada, are expected to emerge from their underground burrows in the New York area. This is the 17th year and drum their compelling love song to herald yet another cycle of their amazing and mysterious 17-year lifespan on top of everything else. Now it's the 17-year locust. <laughs> well, now, I'm going to guarantee you that half of you, probably 90% of you, never heard a cicada. Nor do you know what they sound like. If you've ever heard one, you wouldn't believe You know, you just can't forget it. It says... This year's invasion of cicadas, popularly misnamed the 17-year locust, began several weeks ago below the Mason-Dixon line and is now slowly spreading northward. In fact, the insects are about a week behind. They are long expectant emergence on Long Island Sound, upstate New Jersey, and parts of New York. Now, uh, already it's happening down in Chevy Chase. Two weeks ago, there are cicadas, quote, everywhere, hanging on shrubs, shrubs, covering hedges, calling their mates with a sound like rushing water from dawn until dusk. That's not true. It doesn't sound like a... You want me to imitate a cicada as best I can? There's no way to imitate it. Now, wait, let me give it. it it's, a, it's a sound... Now, now we used to have a lot of cicadas. This is, a, this is the national bird of Indiana. And, uh, yeah, it's about the best they can do. And uh, this is the loudest, most, most wild-sounding bug that lives... And I'll never forget the time the 17-year cicadas came down our main street. I think I told that story before. I was standing out on the porch, and it was a June day, a really hot June day. Temperature was like maybe 100. And uh, I saw this cloud. I was a kid. It was about, you know, 7 or 8 or 9 or something. And I see this cloud, a black cloud, coming down the street. It was off in the distance. It looked like a rain cloud. Went all the way up to the sky. It was a big cloud. You could, it was almost like seeing an advancing roll of fog or something, a dark cloud coming. And all the while, you could hear this humming sound, a slow, building, droning, humming sound. And by the time I got in the house, the first, you know, the avant-garde was already eating our garage. And uh, <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, my mother's running around locking the doors, and for about an hour... The entire neighborhood was covered. Fantastic! All over the, all over the street, and the, and they they ate up the lawns. They ate uh, Mr. Bruner's shoe, 
And, uh, yeah, well, he was drunk. He was laying out there under the porch. See, they got a hold of his tennis shoes, and that was the end of the ball game. Nothing left. There was only the, the left, the only thing that was left of, of his clothes were the two buttons from his bing yank overalls. That was it. They just work him over like, you know, like eating corn on a cob. But the sound of a, of a cicada is, 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 it, is a sound, if you've ever heard it, you can't forget it. And if, if you haven't, there's no way to describe it. It seems to come from everywhere to begin with. It fills the air, one cicada. And it's tremendously loud. And it starts something like this. I'll try to fake it a little bit here. the sound of the 17-year cicada, roughly, very roughly. There's no way to fake it. And then, are they something? They're big. Big. And that is the, uh, that is the male cicada that makes that sound. And he is calling for action, <laughs> is what he's really doing. And, uh, and uh, if you want to hear the rest of, or a little bit, part of this, uh, I, I can't read all of it because the big thing it says, uh, a cicada is a stout, dark-bodied insect with a large, transparent set of wings. There are 17 broods of periodical cicadas named with Roman numerals, one of which emerges each year somewhere in the eastern part of the country. Isn't that fascinating? That means there are 17 separate tribes. Each has a Roman numeral. This I didn't know about. And they pop up a different part in the country, in the eastern part of the country. This year's brood, Brood 10, X. Brood 10 is the largest and most widespread. During the summer of 1953, when Brood 10 was last visible, as many as 40,000 brown-skinned cicada nymphs were seen to burrow out from under a single oak tree within a few hours of each other. 40,000 out of one oak tree. Despite numerous theories, says Dr. Jerome G. Rosen, Jr., chairman of the Department of Entomology at the American Museum of Natural History, listen to this one. Despite numerous theories, no one knows what signals them all to come out together. It is one of the great biological mysteries. Nobody knows. They just come out. And Brood 10, isn't that a great name? Brood 10 is about to emerge. And underground is Brood 13. They say that Brood 13 was given that name because this is a ravenous brood. It has been known to eat the soles off guys' shoes. And Brood 13 is resting. And now Brood 10 is slowly moving into life. And they will have a brief period during summer, this summer. And then they will disappear. And they will not appear again. We'll figure it out. 17 years, 1987. Who knows what kind of a world they'll see. Imagine these babies coming out now. This, remember, this brood has not been around since 53 Let's see, who was president? Ike was president. I stretch, you know. Imagine him looking around, looking for those 53 Fords. And what did they see? Gremlins. What happened? You know, 1953, Dave Garraway was doing the Today Show. And in a few weeks, they'll be moving over Jersey. Well, I will never forget that day that they came down that main street in Hammond, Indiana. And in, I would say, less than two and a half hours, this particular brood, I didn't even know they had numbers, but in less than two and a half hours, they stripped every leaf of every tree for at least ten miles around. 
and you could see them disappearing. You know, they go in a in a great cloud. They they all hang together, and they disappeared towards the west, towards the setting sun, like some great cloud of blackish smoke. And you could hear them humming. It was a kind of from a distance. You could just hear this. And they were gone. A few freelance cicadas would work around there every summer. But the great brood had disappeared. And, you know, for years after that, people always talked about the cic- Of course, they always called them locusts out there. Nobody called them cicadas. So they always used to say, uh, you remember the time the locusts come? And you'd see people get sort of pale. Well, as a matter of fact, I remember Mrs. Scott across the street had a had a line of washout. And these babies went from one end of the wash line to the other. Apparently, they, they liked her blue starch. <laughs> and they just ate, you know, collars, buttons, the whole bit. So it's going to be a big year. Piranhas. Cicadas. You can buy a Blue Cross thing for your dog. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, it's liable to go all the way. It's all right. Oh, you want me to do a commercial? All right. Be glad to do a commercial. The cicadas are coming. Ah, they're flying in formation! They're spelling out year one. 28 million cicadas in a mystic formation. Carrying posters that contain mystic symbols. You look into this year one poster long enough and you will see your whole life laid out before you past present future in one vast mystical beetle rock ball of wax year one get that two dollars in quick send it to year one 460 west 34th street new york new york i repeat a two dollar check or money order to year one 460 West 34th Street, New York, New York. Money back if not satisfied. Year one. (laughs) What a nasty, mean sound. An evil sound. It's been a strange show tonight. Listen to that. We've been sending out special aphrodisiac waves. Oh, you. This is all part of the electronic experimentation that we're doing here. I mean, if the shoe fits, you can wear it. If the shoe wears, you can fit it. So breathe deep. Think long and hard. What brood are you part of? Is there a generation gap between cicada broods? <laughs> Now it's locusts. I kind of like them, though. I kind no, I really do. I, I think it's kind of a good development. You know, it's something that's so big that nobody can fight it. it just won't do you any good to complain. Thank you. Thank you.